Good morning, everyone. This is Eric Lordi. I am the current president of Northwest Akuho, and I'm very excited to welcome you today. We are uh, very privileged to have Anne-Marie Klotz calling in and doing our a presentation uh, from the New York Institute of Technology on her dissertation research, A High Heel in the Door. Um, Anne-Marie has uh, been a, a great supporter of Northwest Akuho over the last few years. Um, being a uh, working at Oregon State University, and we're really excited to have her on. Uh, at any time during the conference call, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the dialogue or meeting chat box, and myself or Anne Marie will uh, uh, pull those up and read them for people and so that Anne Marie can ask those questions. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to Anne Marie. Okay, thank you so much, Eric, and thank you to uh, Northwest Akuho. Good morning, uh, West Coasters. <laughs> the time zone changes can be very different as you travel from coast to coast. I am so pleased to be here today. Originally, I had scheduled to do this program at Northwest Akuho back in February. Uh, that was sort of before the great blizzard of the Northwest <laughs> had occurred. And so when they asked me if I would still be interested in doing this, um, I was happy to do so. Um, my research that I'm going to present today is based on, on very current uh, research. I defended my dissertation in April, and everything just got uploaded and published about two weeks ago. Uh, and so, yeah, this is hot off the press. And so I hope that this conversation today, um, while one-sided and maybe a little bit awkward because we can't do the direct interaction, I hope that it continues um, to occur even after this webinar. So whether it's through social media or whether it's through email, however, a personal conversation I would love to chat with you more about it. And so if you, um, if you signed up to be on this webinar before this morning, I sent a quick email out to folks uh, letting them know how to get involved, to use the hashtag Northwest Kuho when tweeting out questions or comments, or to use my Twitter handle, which is at Anne Marie Klotz. So let's get started. I recently finished my degree from DePaul University uh, in educational leadership, and I knew from the second that I started my program that I wanted to do my study on female college presidents. A couple years before uh, starting that doctoral program, my former supervisor at DePaul, Deb Schmidt Rogers, and I decided to create a little documentary. We decided to go around the Midwest and interview five or so women who were at the associate vice president level or higher. So we interviewed provosts and deans, AVPs, and a president as well uh, to get a sense of what it's like to be a woman in the top levels of leadership. Uh, we didn't really know what we would find, uh, but we knew that we were excited to begin the project. Every time we left one of these five women's offices, we would be in the parking lot saying things like, no, that one was my new favorite interview, <laughs> because they were all just so good. And they had so many interesting insights about leadership that, that we had never considered. And so if you had asked me, for example, what I thought I might find once I did these interviews um, for the documentary, I would say, oh, I don't know. These women are probably you know, extremely extroverted, super chatty, because they have these big roles that they have to do at their universities. We found the opposite it to be true. Uh, most of the women who we interviewed identified as being an introvert. Uh, most had very, very different um, and varied career paths. And it just sparked an interest about how women get to these positions, who supports and sponsors them along the way, and what we can learn about their journey to inform future women who aspire to be in their chair. And so, therefore, as I started my program at DePaul a couple of years later, it was clear to me that I wanted to learn more about women in leadership, specifically women presidents. Um, I have many goals in life, but one of my goals is to open the door as wide as we can so that uh, talented folks can assume the presidency. And what we know about the history of academia is that it's largely uh, male-dominated and it largely has not been a diverse pool. And so um, anything that we can do that can shed insight on how to move the needle forward, I'm all in. And therefore, that's where our project begins. And so as I started my research, I thought everybody would be on board. You know, they would say, oh, my gosh, what a great project. This is fantastic. But instead, I actually encountered a lot of folks who said, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this research? I mean, it's, it's 2013. It's 2014. You know, why is the leadership uh, research about women even necessary? And to them, I say this quote by Dr. Drew Gilpin Foss, president of Harvard University, personifies why it is that this research is still incredibly needed. She recently said at a conference in Switzerland, I'm not the woman president of Harvard. I'm the president of Harvard. And so if someone like Dr. Faust, uh, arguably, uh, you know, one of the top ranked presidents at an Ivy League institution, still has to share this message, clearly there is so, so much work to be done. 
Also, the numbers don't lie. What we know is that 23% of college presidents are currently headed by women. When we take out four-year, or excuse me, when we take out two-year and community college institutions, that number plummets to 13. So even though um, the numbers have remained sort of consistent over the years, uh, they're not going up. And certainly, the largest places where we see female presidents are at schools that are on the lower levels of the Carnegie classifications, and so therefore are paid less as well. And so I think my research was really about saying if we look at women who are at quote unquote elite institutions, women who are at the high research institutions, how are they getting there? Because all of the research and all of the numbers d supports that they should not be there. And that's where I began my journey. And so I decided to look at the journey of 10 female college presidents from all across the country. In the summer of 2013, uh, let's just say I got a lot of frequent flyer miles. Um, sponsored through a Kickstarter campaign by friends and family, uh, I raised over $5,000 to travel uh, to go see these female college presidents. Um, you know it's pretty bad when the uh, custodians and janitors at the PDX airport know your name. Um, and so clearly I had been doing a lot of traveling, especially in July and August of, of the summer of 2013. Um, I wanted to go see them in their spaces. I wanted to learn more about their journey. I wanted to hear um, what information they had to share with women who aspired to be in their chair someday. As part of a doctoral program, you typically create research questions, overall research questions that frame the study, different than your interview questions. These were mine. Question one, how do women colleges, college presidents experience and make meaning of their professional trajectory? And question two, how does gender inform the personal and professional experience of women college presidents? What shapes that experience and meaning making? So any of you who may be in a program or have aspirations of being in a program should know that these couple of sentences, you know, can take about six months to construct. So just a word to the wise that constructing a research question that really gets to the heart of what it is you want to study that's creating new knowledge can be really challenging. But I feel very good about these because I feel like these questions really hit the heart of what it is I was trying to find out. So then you have to create cr participant criteria. Um, who are the people that you're going to be interviewing? And you can see on your screen here a little bit about some of my criteria, that they identified as a woman, that they were currently employed at a college or university at a four-year institution, that they've been employed in their role for at least a couple of years, and that they had one or more of these identifiers, either being at a research-focused university, uh, previously employed as a university provost, identifies as a woman of color, or has less than five years' experience as a university president. A couple things about why these sub-qualifiers. Um, Research-focused institutions, um, other than Ivy League, are some of the highest level institutions, and I wanted to get a sense of, of the trajectory of those women. Uh, why previously employed at the university provost is because it is, as of today, the most common path for people to get to the presidency. So I wanted to chat with folks who had that experience. I absolutely wanted a diverse pool and went aggressively after uh, candidates of color to try to hear more about their story, but it was incredibly challenging as there are few, um, and you can only imagine the schedules of, of college presidents across the country and all the times folks are often asked to do things like this. So while I was happy to secure one woman of color, I know that any future research that I will do, um, I will definitely um, do my best to try to secure a larger pool. And finally, I was also looking for someone who has uh, five years experience or less as a university president to kind of get their fresh perspective and the things that they were seeing as well. So let's meet them. So of my 10 women, uh, six came from an academic path. One came from a practitioner uh, background. Actually, she had been the vice president of student affairs before assuming the presidency. Two had a combination of both faculty roles and um, practitioner roles, and one came up straight through corporate. Uh, she had run uh, multi-billion dollar businesses before and happened to be at a dinner with the board of trustees um, for this institution, and they said, hey, you've run companies. How about running a university? And I think we'll see more and more of that uh, continue as institutions are looking for fiscally responsible, politically savvy people to run their institutions. Um, in terms of institutional profile, uh, some schools may fit in more than one category, which is why the numbers don't add up, but you can kind of see there how it balances out in terms of public and private and the type of institution that they have, and I felt good about the variety uh, of roles that you see there. In terms of tenure of the position, um, uh, three folks had five or less years in the role, four, uh, five to ten years, and three, ten to twenty. So again, I felt like we had a good range of perspectives in terms of experience. 
In terms of uh, family education, I, had, I hadn't asked this question as part of the interview question, but all 10 of them shared through their story um, about their family education. And um, I think that's very interesting as well because clearly that has shaped the ways in which they view education and, and their future as well. And four of them identified as first-generation college students, which I think is significant, uh, and six did not. In terms of family status, six are currently married with children, three are married with no children, and one is divorced and has children. And um, this wasn't, again, a pre-qualifier factor. It's it just randomly how, how it came out. Um, and they had lots of things to say, as I'm sure you can all imagine, about the role of family uh, and career. Okay, everyone loves a good chart. So how to explain this? So within my research, within the 10 interviews, after they were transcribed, um, you go into the coding part where you're basically figuring out what did this leadership tell us? These were the four areas, the four themes that I was able to pick out uh, based on pouring over their amazing stories. I will tell you, once I got um, all of the, the audio of their stories recorded, I would often listen to them uh, while I was on a run, while I was on a walk, while I was in the car, uh, just because you can hear different things coming out from the data each time you read it. Um, but these are the four things that really stuck out. So the first area is around challenges to advancement. What are the things that are preventing women from going forward? Um, and the areas that fell underneath that were things like work-life negotiation, quality of life issues, mid-level career experiences, structural barriers, and the mirror effect, um, all of which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a bit. The second was around necessary actions and characteristics. What is it that you need to be a president and to be a leader? And these three pieces uh, stuck out so strongly uh, in, the, in the research around risk-taking, having self-confidence, and the ability to be adaptable in your work. Theme three talked a lot about mentors and sponsors. Who are the people who are encouraging folks? Who was saying their name when they were not in the room in terms of um, advocating for them for opportunities? And finally, the importance of paying it forward. Now that they are in this role, what can they do uh, to pay that forward? Finally, the fourth theme, presidential leadership. And this is about what does a president look like? What should they look like? What, does they, what do they sound like? How do people take leadership um, coming from a woman? And so um, these were some of the areas that they talked about, um, talking about perceptions in the hiring and evaluation process, what it looks like when women attain critical mass in the room, and a little bit about their own uh, self-perceptions as well. So from these four themes and then the, the sub-themes that fall uh, underneath them, I created an um, excuse me. I created a theoretical concept to construct them together, and that is right here. So basically, I have two theoretical components: stepping forward and gender matters, and those connect our themes. Under the theme of, of stepping forward, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, all four of the major themes connected to this theoretical construct, and under the construct of gender matters, two themes in particular connected to that. Oops. Sorry. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about how those connect. This, um, this uh, diagram is really important because this to me is what the dissertation is. This is what is telling us something, and we'll talk about what that something is in just a bit. All right, so um, stepping forward. So why don't we talk about stepping forward first? This is something that um, especially in a post-lean-in kind of world, was really interesting to hear people talk about. Uh, I should also say that all of my participants uh, are at the early end, mid to late 40s, and at the upper end, uh, mid 60s. And so there were some varied experiences here based on age and based on generation. But very clearly, this piece about stepping forward was so important. This is where women said that the biggest thing holding back women was themselves. The inability to take risks, to um, put themselves in positions that might be a little uncomfortable but that could have long-term gain, long gain was extremely important. They talked about how if women have six of the ten qualifications to apply for a job, they won't apply. But a man might have two, and he'll completely apply. And so stepping forward asks you to do the thing that's a little bit uncomfortable to have long-term gain, long gain. They also talked about um, the importance of being geographically mobile. 
And they said, we recognize how challenging this can be, especially in order to build community and to have a family um, and all the pieces that go along with that. But many of them were able to assume those roles because they always went where the very best job was. And they had shared moments where they or female colleagues tended to overthink things instead of just saying, instead of just saying, I'm going to step forward and I'm going to take on this responsibility and I'm going to apply for this job. They also talked about the importance of stretch assignments. Stretch assignments are things where uh, it's a little bit out of your comfort zone, but you can absolutely learn so much from doing it. So an example, a woman told me that uh, in the early 1990s, she was asked at her very large Research One institution to be the person to install computers on their campus, all across their campus for their 40,000 students, computer labs, um, in the residence halls, you name it. Um, and she certainly didn't work in IT uh, and had no idea how to do this. And I said, well, what did you think? And she said, well, of course. I said, yes, I I'm your woman. I'll, I'll be I'll be happy to do this. And I said, well, what were you thinking? And she said, I was thinking how I had never even turned on a computer before. And so her willingness to take a stretch assignment is because she knows that past performance is the best indicator of future success. And when you feel good about the job you've done before, it's easier to say, yes, this, this seems really scary, but I'm going to try and do it. And so she really encouraged women to think about what are the stretch assignments that they can take? What are the things that they are progressively adding to their agenda every year to get more and more experience? Because, and many of our presidents echoed this, doing your job and doing it really, really well isn't good enough to get you promoted. It's good enough for you to keep the job. And so in order for you to get promoted or to get the next job, it's about the job that you leave after five years, the job description, I'm sorry, should be drastically different than the one you started in year one because you've been adding things to it along the way. You've been unafraid to take risks. You're willing to say, hey, I can do this. I want to take on more. It's really about taking the leap um, and believing in yourself. One of the stories that a president told me was about how her boss brought her into uh, his office before she was obviously the president and said, hey, I have this new and exciting job opportunity available, and um, let me tell you all about it. So he does, and um, she was super excited about the position. And he said, do you know anyone who would be really good for it? And she paused, and then she thoughtfully listed about six different people and talked about why they would be so good in that role. And the boss uh, shook his head and looked at her and said, you know, I actually was considering you for this role, but now, you know, I'm not so sure. You've told me about all these other people who could be really great for it. And this president talked about the importance of stepping forward in that moment and saying, no, hey, actually, I would be great for this. Because I asked her, I said, did you want it? And she said, of course I did, but I didn't think I could ask for it. And stepping forward is the thing that, that women need to be able to learn how to do because oftentimes our male colleagues are the first ones to say, well, look no further, I'm here. And we have to be comfortable with doing that. Just yesterday, um, side note, I had two different text messages from folks who were needed help in their negotiation. And the thing they kept saying is, oh, I just don't want to ask. It'll make me seem arrogant. It'll make me seem like this or like that. And the lessons I've really learned from these women are about you can't think in that way. You have to, you know, professionally and um, appropriately ask for the things you want and take your place and be ready to step forward. Another important part uh, of, of the research was really about thinking about the role of mentors and sponsors and the ways in which they open doors for you. And so many of them talked about how they had no set career plan or path, but the people who were around them constantly encouraged them to think about what their potential could be. There's so much literature out there right now about mentorship and sponsorship. I think about it in terms of mentorship, sponsorship, and coaching. So a mentor can say, Hey, Anne-Marie, look at that door. Let's talk about why you should go through that door. What are the pros and cons of opening that door? A coach might say, hey, Anne-Marie, here's how you open the door. You put your hand on the door, you apply a little bit of pressure, you squeeze tight, and you turn to the right. They are actually giving you the skills. And the third kind is the sponsor who says, you know what, I'm going to throw open that door for you because I know that you can do what is on the other side of that door. All of these women had a combination of those sorts of people in their lives. And as you think about your own careers, who are those mentors, sponsors, and coaches for you? They also don't have to be lifetime commitments. They can be one week or one day commitments. Um, but you need people in your life like that who can propel you at all levels. One of the challenges that they mentioned uh, was about 
middle management and how women often get stuck at the middle management level. Uh, they talked about it from the professoriate side where uh, people would kind of get a little bit further in the tenure process and then sort of stop or would not go from assistant professor to associate professor to full professor. Uh, on the practitioner side, uh, mid-level, which can be defined in a whole lot of different ways, anywhere through uh, a coordinator to an assistant director to a director, um, that's where women get to and stay. They feel comfortable there. They feel like they can contribute there. They maybe are not super, super challenged there, but, it, but you can be an assistant director at 25 or at 65. It's one of those rare roles where um, people can choose to, to have it be a temporary spot or a permanent spot. And so for folks who aspire to higher level positions, the key is to not get stuck here, to have a plan, to not be at a mid-level role forever, if that is what you want. And that's, that's a larger part of what the presidents were talking about is it's okay to stay or to do or to move, but you have to be willing to make a conscious choice. You have to be willing to say, yes, I aspire to this and this and this, or you know what, this is really good. This is where I'm at. This is where I'll stay. But you can't opt out of leadership. You have to make a decision about what it is that you want your life to be. But the mid-level piece was really important and was often the part where they said women got stuck the most and really relied on um, especially mentors and sponsors to help move them forward. Some of the challenges that they talked about are structural. Hey, this is actually a picture from Oregon. Um, it's, we're structural barriers. So, for example, when I worked at DePaul University in Chicago, we didn't start the workday until 9. And so I asked, because I had always worked at schools that started at 8, why did we start the, you know, the workday at 9, just out of curiosity? And they said, well, we start at 9 because a lot of people may have family responsibilities or elder care responsibilities, or they may want to work out in the morning. And that is one barrier we can remove for people. At Oregon State, we did a great job with having lactation rooms and having resources and services for parents. Those are structural barriers that we're trying to remove. And so presidents talked a lot about some of the structural barriers that prevent women, particularly at mid-career or at mid-family, um, from feeling like they can move on. Flex work environments, job shares, those are all things that are solutions to structural barriers. And so the presidents talked about the different schools they had worked at and um, how those schools did or did not support um, those pieces. What we still know is that gender matters. The women talked at length about the intense ways they have been critiqued as leaders. They talked about everything from being critiqued from the kind of mustard that they pick at the opening day picnic to the length of their dress to if they should go with clear or red nail polish. And this is definitely something that we spent a lot of time talking about, um, as I felt personally as well. Um, there's intense critique in any kind of leadership role. You add a, la a layer anytime you add um, a gender or diversity characteristic to that, to that mix. And women talked about being critiqued in ways that their male colleagues would not, um, being intensely critiqued if they gained a couple pounds, um, being critiqued on the kind of car they had or if they spent time with their family, too much time, not enough enough time. Those were things that um, really impacted them and their leadership and the way that they thought about leadership. Another area that was talked about was the mirror effect. And so if I am a 55-year-old man and I'm looking to hire uh, someone new in my department and I look at a younger 25, 30-year-old man, I may say, well, gosh, that man reminds me so much of myself. I think we should hire him, regardless of what his talent or ability level might be. This is something that, um, that men often do, according to the literature as well, um, in terms of hiring and selection. And so not that women aren't uh, immune to this as well, but it was definitely listed by several women as things that they had seen during their career. And oftentimes what had happened is they would hire someone, but it doesn't mean that that would be a successful hire. Something that they encourage men and women across the board is to think about um, what leadership can and should look like. It doesn't have to look like you. It actually probably shouldn't look like you. <laughs> and how can we diversify our workforce in important ways? In thinking about how leadership can and should look like, I was speaking with a president who was at her university's uh, bowl game, which, yes, I had to learn what that meant because I'm not a football person. I'm sure people can make fun of me on this call. Um, and uh, the, this random male alumni came up to her at the football game and said, heck of a game. You know, and she said, oh, yes, you know, the team is doing so well. And he asked her, what is it that you do? And she said, oh, I'm the, I'm the president. And he paused for a second and he said, of what? And she said, of the university. 
And he looked at her and said, no, no way. I mean, you don't look like a president. These are the kind of things that a lot of our women had felt throughout their career, that they did not personify uh, what a president should look like. And so um, that's something that many of them had to sort of rally against. Um, you know, they had been called the administrative assistants, the interns, the chief of staff, but never the president. Um, and so it's so interesting to think about um, how people are viewed in that way, as I, as I don't necessarily think that would have happened with, um, with a male colleague. When you Google the word powerful people, here is what comes up. And while I'm sure these man, men are very powerful, I believe they're politicians, mostly from um, South and North Dakota, um, what would the world look like if, if when we pow Googled powerful people, a more diverse group came up? And these, again, were the common sentiments from the president, these ideas about what leadership sh should look like. Another president talked about one time when she was um, in a lower level position and she was on a search committee uh, to hire a president for her institution. They were going back and forth about a certain candidate talking about strengths and weaknesses. The, this one man on the committee was talking about a finalist and he was enthusiastically endorsing him. He said, oh my gosh, he's great. He looks like a president. He smokes a pipe. And, you know, to which my female president said, you know, Frosty the Snowman also smokes a pipe. It doesn't mean he should be the president of a university. And so we need to really think about what leadership can and should look like. Uh, we all have defaults. When you think about the words university president and you close your eyes and you conjure an image up, you probably might think of a white man. Or maybe you didn't because you went to an undergraduate institution that had a female president. Or maybe you didn't because you currently do. And so... Um, we need to think about what we, are, what we are doing and what we are saying consciously and unconsciously about leadership when we make these assumptions about people, especially in the hiring process where it matters the most. I think about it all the time as a supervisor. Uh, in my role as, as a leader, we have decision-making rights over people's professional lives, and that's something that I take very seriously. And so what does it mean when we put the man on the campus master planning committee and put the woman on the recognition committee? So I, I think about those kinds of things all the time as we're thinking about talent and best fit and where we put people. And do we need people to serve on both committees? Absolutely. And do we need a diversity of people on those committees? Absolutely. But we need to think seriously about professional development and what leadership opportunities look like. In the final part of my, um, of my webinar, I'd like to talk a little bit about implications for practice. And then if there are any questions, I would be happy to take those as well. That's the good stuff, right? Okay, implications for practice. Number one is take regular skill inventories. Now, this is different than filling out your actual performance appraisal and saying, you know, here's what I do well, here's what I don't do well. Write down your skills. And so an activity that I often did with new folks that I supervised is I would say, hey, go out and find a job description of a job that you might love to do in five years. And maybe in five years you won't love, but just for this activity, pick a job like that. They came back, we looked at it, and I said, okay, now – Underline all the skills that you do have that they're asking for, and then circle all the ones you don't. And let's think about ways to get you experiences in all of the circles, so that even if that isn't your dream job at the end of five years, you still have a whole lot more transferable skills to use in the next job. And that is what these women were talking about as well. We can't just rest on our laurels of doing our job and doing it well. We have to figure out what it is that we do badly <laughs> and fail and probably fail again, and every year come up with a new list of skills, skill development, that we really want to get. Secure mentors and sponsors. This can look different for everyone. Um, I know these are, these are big buzzwords, but these are also um, reciprocal relationships, and they're kind of like dating. You know, it's not like that book, you know, Are You My Mother or Will You Be My Mother. <laughs> it, it's more like uh, how do we feel about each other? Do we like each other? Could we create something great together? You reflect, uh, you are a credit to your mentor or to your sponsor. So what are you doing right now that makes you sponsorable? What are you doing right now to get your name out there, to be in a leadership role, to present, to publish, to win an award, to do something great so that people say, yeah, yeah, I want to attach my name to that. So think about how we can secure mentors and sponsors that best reflect our goals. Some of these folks in my life have been um, quick relationships. Some have been more longstanding, um, but all with an eye on saying, what are your goals and how can we help you get there? And the first step in that is knowing what your goals are and finding people that you trust to share and talk through them. Next, 
develop professional search committees who are committed to hiring diverse candidates. One thing I really liked about um, my time at Oregon State was that on search committees, we always had what we call a search advocate. And that's a trained person who would be on every single search committee we would have at the university that was dedicated to making sure that we were having um, unbiased search processes. So everything from consistency of the search process for each candidate to the language that we use in interviews to how we structured the day to accessibility issues, that's what that person was there for. And I think that's a great um, industry standard and best practice. Uh, create professional development opportunities that defy stereotypical gender norms. Again, going back to the campus master planning versus the recognition committee, uh, what are we doing to flip the script on what we think men and women can or, or should not do? Um, think about all the ways in which we can provide good opportunities for people, and think about the ways that we can stretch folks, too. So you may look at your administrative assistant and think, oh, well, he or she can't possibly do that. How do you know? Um, I used to have an assistant who came from um, a totally different industry, and I was amazed at all the work that she had done. She had once coordinated a move to move for 1,400 people's offices. She had like a huge office move. Uh, I think she had some organizational ability, wouldn't you say? And so we don't know unless we ask about what are um, opportunities and things that people want to do um, and how can we help create those experiences for them. Next, demand for more women to be at the table. If you're in a meeting and you notice that you're the one woman around 18 construction dudes, maybe there's a way to bring in a little bit more diversity around the table. So think about ways in which you can share your voice. And I also recognize that there's a power dynamic here, especially depending on what level you're at professionally. This can feel challenging. So work with your supervisor to figure out ways um, to be able to advocate for more women to be at the table. Uh, advocate for yearly institutional climate surveys. A lot of schools do this, um, but a lot don't. Uh, climate surveys are really important. Basically what they are is they say, how are we doing as a campus community and what are some things that we can change? So maybe you do find out um, from your campus climate survey that there aren't lactation rooms on campus and that is causing a huge frustration for mothers on your campus. What can you do about that? And so um, find out um, through your HR office if your institution does uh, climate surveys and what they do with that information information and who is responsible for implementing change. Advocate for women and parent-friendly policies, um, and this isn't exclusive to, to just women, clearly. Um, if there are things that we can do differently on our campuses to help support people and support families, whether it is I'm thinking about flexibility and time or job sharing, we should be doing that. And, and finally, share stories. Uh, I think that when I hear these stories from, from these women, what I often did was shake my head in understanding uh, because I had been there with some of the things that they're talking about. They made me laugh when they told me at the ways in which they had messed up or failed, and we've all been there too. Um, but most importantly, what I think that I heard was that um, when you are going through really challenging stuff at work, you're not alone. Um, and because we often don't share some of those big things, people can feel like they're, they're living in isolation, that they're the only ones that are going through these challenging situations. And these women were so candid about their stories. And um, I, I'm, I can definitely tweet out the link if you'd like to read some of their more in-depth uh, stories. But um, it was inspiring to me to hear that they had failed and failed again that they had been critiqued very often. One woman said to me, I'm the president of a university. On any given day, 90% of the people here don't like me. That's not my job. My job isn't to be liked. It's to be respected. And so, um, you know, as you think about how we frame our work, um, you know, it, always, it isn't always just about getting along and playing in the sandbox well with everyone. It's about saying, how are we helping to get these kids to graduation? And how are we creating environments where, where staff can succeed? And, and to me, the sharing the stories part was, was so incredibly important. Um, and that's something, one of the biggest lessons that I will take with me as well. So why does this research matter? So stepping forward is required because leadership is still a gender issue and gender still matters. And so as we think about some of the concepts that I've talked about today, and again, this is just a snapshot of 207 pages, um, the takeaways for me is that we still have to be mindful of the ways in which leader, a gender impacts leadership, and we still have to know that one of the best ways in which to mitigate some of those challenging situations is to step forward and to take those risks. And again, how do we know that this is still relevant? Because I'll end the way that we started. I'm not the woman president of Harvard. I'm the president of Harvard. 
to some of the folks who are listening today on the call, I hope that you someday may aspire to your highest levels of aspirations, whether that is to be an assistant director or to be a president. But most of all, what I hope for you is that you take risks, that you share stories, that you do the best job that you can, and that you love your work. And so thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with you today. I would be happy to take uh, any questions either online or offline if they have them. Thank you very much, Anne-Marie, uh, a fantastic presentation. Um, just a reminder to individuals that if you do have any questions, you can tweet them or you can put them into the meeting chat box and we will uh, get them to Anne-Marie. So one question that we do have is, what advice do you have for combating horizontal hostility in the workplace? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so um, what I'm assuming that you mean by horizontal hostility can be, uh, you know, horizontal oppression, however you want to define it, um, challenging situations from other women. And absolutely, uh, that happens, and the presidents talked about it as well. One president talked about how the first time she went up to, um, up to be a president or up for a vote, she went to the Board of Trustees, and she, it had to be a unanimous vote, and she lost by two votes. And the only two votes that she did not get were the women on the board. When she talked with them later about it, um, they said, well, we didn't think you were ready and um, had some sort of challenging situations around that in terms of hostility. So I'm certainly, and I hope you don't take away from this research, that this is simply about you know, men oppressing women. This is about women oppressing women, women oppressing themselves, um, and not stepping forward. I think in terms of uh, the hostility or horizontal, horizontal oppression, a couple of things. Number one, this can be especially challenging in smaller departments or units where there just aren't as many people. Um, I think it's also challenging if perhaps your supervisor is part of the problem. Um, it also depends on kind of the nature of your community, your department, and, and how people talk things out. Um, one thing that I really appreciated at a former institution, we had a, a women's network. It was DePaul Women's Network, and it was open to female faculty and staff. And through that program, we had programs and resources every month. We had a mentorship program, a brown bag lunch series, an annual conference, just for the women of that university so that people could meet other people outside of their silo and can, can connect with other women. Um, again, it's about preventing isolation and showing people that they have um, other people that they can rely on. Other than my, my normal student affairs advice, which would be to think about all the things that are bothering you and to pick the top two that you just can't live with <laughs> and to have that conversation with someone, I, I would say you have to ask yourself um, what's contributing to the hostility, what's your role in it, who can be an advocate for you, and if that's your time to, to fix it, to help it, or to leave. And, you know, when you have a huge problem like that, your choice is to accept it, try to change it, or leave it. And that's pretty much what I think about any, any you know, challenging situation in higher ed. So um, I, I always find it useful to talk to someone outside of my institution, someone who can hear it through a different you know, lens and think about ways in which to combat it. Um, but just because there's, I mean, there's, there's a reason why there's a movie called Mean Girls. Like that stuff does actually happen. Uh, it happens in the workforce. It happens in school. It happens everywhere. I think it's up to us to decide what our response is going to be to that. Okay, I'm not sure if there's any more. I'm looking through the feed here. Um, let's see here. I don't see any other questions. Eric, did you have anything else for me? Okay. Well, I th thank you, everyone, um, for taking the time to chat with me today. Please feel free to email, tweet, uh, contact me in any way that you can. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Uh, thanks for sharing some time with me today. Bye-bye.